is therapy in general more useful as a general statement, maybe for women than it is for men? Or is it a totally different kind of therapy that men need? Or, or how does that factor into it? That, that's a good question. Well, women are characterized by higher average levels of negative emotion. So one of the ways of conceptualizing that is that per unit of threat and, and punishment, women will suffer more than men. And we, there's a variety of reasons for that, but I, I think the most fundamental reason is likely that women are wired more than men to respond to distress, distress of infants particularly, and that that gives them a general proclivity to respond to distress. And now the upside of that is, well, infants don't die. The downside of that is women suffer from higher levels of depression and anxiety. And that's true cross-culturally, and it's more true in gender-equal countries. So it looks like it's very, it's a deep difference. Women are also more people and relationship-oriented than men. And that's actually the biggest difference we know between men and women. Women are reliably more interested in people than they are in things. Most people who incline in the therapeutic direction are female or have a relatively feminine temperament. And there are aspects of my temperament, for example, that are quite feminine. So I'm quite high in trait agreeableness, for example, like quite spectacularly high, actually. And that's a more feminine trait because women are also more agreeable than men. So now, so I would say the that listening ear mentality rather than that concrete problem-solving mentality is more feminine than it is masculine. Now, there are more masculine approaches to therapy, like the behavioral approaches are, I would say, more temperamentally masculine. They're a lot more problem-focused. It's like, what the, what the hell's your problem? No, I mean exactly, precisely. And what would you be willing to accept as a solution? And how can we work on that concretely? It's like an engineer's approach to psychological problems. And that's less talky, you know, it's less relationshipy, it's less suffused with emotion. Um, having said that, you know, women are more likely to seek out therapy than men. So they also might is have it, more issues it? to discuss, you know. Well, the thing is, because women are more sensitive to threat and punishment, more things bother them. Now, you might say, get over it. It's like, well, you know, yes and no, because one of the advantages to having a lower threshold for detection of threat is that you see problems earlier. And now the downside is that the false positive problem, right? You see problems when they don't exist, you know, and you're not going to get one of those without the other. It takes very careful discernment to that's partly, I think, why the dynamic of a marriage is so useful for people psychologically. You know, women are going to be more likely in the typical marriage to see where problems might be arising, right? But men are going to be better at constraining that. Now, sometimes the men get too constraining and they'll ignore, you know, and then that's not good. But sometimes the women get too sensitive and are responding to crises that don't exist, and that's not good. And so good communication within a marriage optimizes those two approaches. It's like the, it's a minimization of two kinds of error, false positives and false negatives. And so so would, you, would you say that therapy could be more, as a general statement, is more geared towards women? Because it, it seems to me that women... Uh, this is a very broad statement, obviously, but women, uh, many of their problems or their, their, their unhappiness comes from not feeling uh, understood, especially in a, in a relationship. Not, not feeling understood is, is, is the root of, of many of their you know, uh, problems, whereas for men, and maybe I'm just speaking— well maybe, maybe, maybe I'm extrapolating from, from my own psyche or something. No, but well, you it, are— for, for men, it's—, it's well, the thing about women, like, look, everybody needs to put their cards on the table. Everybody needs that. Now, I would say, as a rule of thumb, <laughs> women have more cards to put on the table. 
And that's a consequence of their enhanced sensitivity to threat. Now, one of the things you find in dealing with women, therapeutically or otherwise, is that if you let them put all their cards on the table, they often figure out for themselves that most of the issues aren't relevant. But they're not going to figure that out without having the forum to do that. This is one of the constant miscommunications between men and women. So women will bring up concerns and the men will think, Jesus, no, really, really, we have to be worried about that. And what the men don't understand exactly is, well, if you let her talk through it, she'd figure out for herself that she doesn't have to be worried about that. But that will not happen without that listening ear. And that that makes communication between very feminine women and very masculine men quite difficult because the very feminine women will be, you know, bringing up issues left, right, and center. And the, the very masculine men are like, let's get to the solution. You know, they're like engineers. Let's get to the solution. It's like, fair enough, you know, but you can't solve the problem till you know what it is. And what the women are doing is saying, well, here's a bunch of things that might be a problem. You know, and, and there's, well, there's, there's utility in that, painful though it is. And it is painful virtually by definition. Now, is, does that mean that the therapeutic process is geared more toward women? I, I think that you, the distinction that we drew earlier between like a more talk-oriented therapy and a more behavioral therapy might be useful to some degree. Behavioral therapy is pretty useful for people who are cut and dried in their apprehensions. You know, it's like, what's the problem here? What are we trying to solve? What are the simplest solutions we can take? Like I said, it's a very engineering approach to the, to the realm of navigation. So I would say that most more masculine men would find behavioral psychology much less, much more uh, palatable. It's not so emotion-focused. It's not so feeling-focused. And I'm not recommending it for everyone. I mean, it, it bloody well, the other thing you got to understand, too, is that finding a therapist is like finding a lawyer. Like, a bad lawyer. There's nothing more expensive than a bad, cheap lawyer. It's really hard to find yeah. a good lawyer. It's really hard to find a good psychologist. Like, that's a difficult thing to manage. I mean... When people ask me how to go about doing that, I would say, or I, I did say, at least until recently, that you should find a PhD in clinical psychology from a American Psych Psychological Association approved clinical school that focuses on research. See, one of the things that clinical psychologists have that physicians don't is that well-trained clinicians are actually scientists. And people think doctors physicians are scientists, and they're not, not even a bit. They're not trained to be scientists. They don't know how to analyze the research literature. They don't know how to conduct research. They don't have that mode of thinking drilled into them. That takes years. Now, the American Psychological Association and these other accrediting organizations have become corrupt, and so, you know, that's a problem. But I would still say as a rule of thumb, PhD psychologist from APA approved school. That's a good first pass approximation. At least, you got, at least you've got someone then who is intelligent and conscientiousness, conscientious. At least that. That's not a bad start. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like access to my full show with no ads, you should go to dailywire.com and use promo code Walsh to get two months free on all annual plans. See you there.